Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we want to be of one mind so we can glorify God, our Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's really, it really is a blessing just to be able to spend time in the Word. Yes, it is. Um, you know, it, it's, it should be a joy to you. John the Baptist said that his joy was made complete because he heard the voice of the bridegroom. Mm -hmm. I pray that we all hear the voice of the bridegroom in the study. It's not about what I have to say or Mark or Alice. It's about what God is saying to all of us. Amen. And I want to remind you one of one other thing as we begin, that we're not here to become Bible scholars. No. We're not here to get a better title on your business card, mm -hmm. you know, get promoted from sweeper to apostle or something. The goal of our instruction is love. Yes. That we understand and know the love of God in our lives more and more. Mm -hmm. And that we learn how to love like him more and more and more. Because the, the purpose of us being here, and you know, this is what it says on our Bible Talk website, is we are proclaiming God's word, but it is powered by his love. Mm -hmm. So seek that in your life. Let that be the goal of our time together, is that you leave here having a greater appreciation and knowledge of God's love. And by the way, as this Bible study comes to an end, please don't let that be the end of this Bible study. Mm -hmm. Spend time having conversation with the Lord God. Talk to him about it. Ask him, you know, was that right? Okay. <laughs> test it, test it. <laughs> and hopefully to make sure that it is right, Mark's going to ask God's blessing on our time right now. Oh, oh Lord, we just thank you for your word, and we thank you for your son who came down and died for our sins and conquered sin and death Amen. for us. Hallelujah. And, Lord, we just... Pray that we might hear from you and the Holy Spirit and put whatever needs to be put in our lives and our hearts there. And we just thank you for your word and your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're in the fourth chapter. We started in our uh, last week uh, in, the, in the fourth chapter of the book of the prophet Amos. Okay. okay. And we're going to pick it up again. And I just want to repeat that first verse because we didn't, we kind of went, and by the way, I don't get distracted and go off, but the spirit of God can lead us in different places Yes. because ultimately this is not a study of Amos. This is a study of God's word, right. wherever the spirit might lead, right? <laughs> but when we're going to talk about those fat cows of Bashan, I thought it would be best to have my, <laughs> my, my lovely wife, Alice. Yes. Read that. Read, read that verse. So if you would read Amos 4, 1, 4. <laughs> oh. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. You know, there really is a lot there. And I, I, I think we've talked uh, pretty much enough about it. But I do want you to understand is God a misogynist? You know what a misogynist is? Uh, Anti-female. Anti Anti-female. Ah, okay. I promise you, he is not. And the that church is, is not supposed to be either. Okay? What he is against is, he's against ungodly attitudes and ungodly lifestyles, right? Uh, I, I don't think he's particularly picking on women. And do bear in mind that if he were, it, that counts for all of us. Forget the transgender stuff and the nonsense that's going on. But the simple fact of the matter is we, us, we are the bride of Christ. That's right. Okay. And in Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female. female. Right. Okay. So it's a different, uh, different approach to it. So women shouldn't be offended with this. They shouldn't get offended. Women who are godly. <laughs> Well, and men who are godly should not get offended at anything. That's and right. bear in mind that Jesus is a rock of offense over whom men stumble. That's right. Because it says, and you probably heard this come from all three of us at one point or another. It says in Psalm, verse, Psalm 119, verse 165, it says that those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. If you get offended by something, you need to repent. That's right. And if you, get, and if you do get offended by this... 
you need to stop oppressing the poor and crushing the needy. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's what it's directed to. If, if, if the word of God pokes at you, remember that what it's poking at is your flesh. That's right. Okay? Mm-hmm. Because the word of God is profitable. I mean, the word of God, what, what are we doing here? I said the goal of our instruction is love. Mm-hmm. But remember, the word of God, whatever was written in earlier times, was written for our instruction so that we would have encouragement. Mm-hmm. And Peter wrote, that, you know, this word, we've been given everything here so that we might become partakers of the divine nature, so that we might become more and more like Jesus Christ. And the one thing we shouldn't do is get offended, right? Absolutely. We should have a great desire in our lives. And we've talked about this here in, in Amos, because it is the purpose of a true prophet, is to expose in us anything that is not Christ-like Amen. so that it can be dealt with, mm-hmm. Right? I mean, that's what I want. I want to be purified. I, 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 I'm going to get sidetracked. Right? I mean, I was reading the other day, and you'll probably know this psalm, Create me a clean heart. I was going to say that, yeah. You know, that's, that's the cry of David, a man after God's own heart. And when I read that verse, and I, have, I can't begin to tell you how many times I've read that verse. I can't begin to tell you how many times I have taught and preached on that verse. Mm-hmm. But when I read it the other day, it was like, boom, something grabbed me. Mm. And I said, Lord, that's what I want. I want that. I want that broken and contrite heart. heart. Yes. I want that that spirit, Lord God, that was in. So the word is good for doing that. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. But I'm going to talk about women because the word of God says that in a natural, at least, they are the weaker sex. Yes, right? absolutely. And the fact is, <clears throat> when we're talking about this prosperity message, and if you remember, if you were here for our last week's session, if you weren't, go watch it, okay? It's still there on, on demand. But it's like, it's abominable what I see in the world around me. How much, how much women are spending on just ridiculous things. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I see this all the time in the immorality, okay? God doesn't want that. I mean, think about what Paul wrote to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, he said, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. I should let Alice teach this. You know, it says that the older women, not that you're old, baby, that the older women should teach the younger women, all right? But that's, we don't, I don't see a lot of teaching in the church on, on, on morality, Praise God for righteousness and we're to pursue righteousness. But there is such a thing as morality. And it says, in, you know, that what we're going to lose in the last days, those perilous last days, it says in Revelation 9, we're, we're going to wind up with a lot of immorality. Yes. Now, if you can't see that, I, am I old? Okay, I'm glad you didn't answer that. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I can't believe you just turn on and see it on the television today. The things are shocking to me. I mean, that you couldn't even conceive of seeing in a movie theater when I was younger. You know, the, the, the immorality, whether it's the, the coarse of mouth, the filth coming out of mouths, the flesh that, that women are showing, it's an abomination. And God is going to deal with that. So, you know, women make a claim to godliness. So think about what Peter wrote. I'm going to read Peter, First Peter 3, verses 1 through 5. Because Peter wrote, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won over without a word by the behavior of their wives. That's an incredible power that a godly wife has. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. But let it be in the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, the former times, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. You know, I know people don't like to hear that anymore. Well, you know what? It's the word of God. And if you don't like the word of God, hey, like I said, you can write to me anytime you want at office at BibleTalk.com. 
Don't write to me and complain about what I read when it's the Word of God. You've got to complain with the Word. Write to, write, write to Jesus at heaven.org. <laughs> okay? In the world that we live in today, modesty is mocked. Yes, it is. Immorality is the rule of the day. Sexual activity is sport. And sexual disease is rampant. It is without doubt the wiles of the devil. It's also encouraged. It, it is absolutely encouraged. You know, I, I'm close to finishing the book that I've been writing for a long time called The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. Because that's what it talks about in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, the whole armor of God. To put them on so you can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The King James says wiles. Mm -hmm. That is a better translation. Because wiles... Is, is talking about as a portrayal of a seduction, right? Mm -hmm. Satan has no power over you. He comes to kill, but he, I, I've said this here many times, he comes as a con man. That's the kind of thief he is. He has to use his tongue. He has to talk you into doing what's wrong. He has no power to force you to do anything. So, women, just think about this. Because I see this and it's, well, let me just say it. Because somebody wiser than I, at least then, mm -hmm. Solomon, given the gift of incredible wisdom above and beyond all, wrote, As a ring of gold in a swine snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. Mm -hmm. I see, you know, all these w beautiful women, and they, I mean, they're, they're repulsive to me. Okay. Why? Because we have turned away from that sound doctrine of the Word of God. That's exactly what Tim, Paul wrote to Timothy and said would happen. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, he said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. So, you know what? You want to desire something? Desire the Lord. That should be the great desire of your heart. You know, it says, it, uh, Delight yourself in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37. But Job, Job 22, 23 to 26 says this, If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. We should be delighting in the Lord. Satan is trying, all he can do, is bait the traps that lie off that path of righteousness that the Spirit of God is leading us in. Yes, it's in First Cor First Corinthians fourteen one it says, "Pursue love, yet desire er earnestly spiritual gifts." You know, you you were talking about de desire. That's desire the things of God. Yes, that's what we should be desiring. That's and again, that's why we gather so we understand. We come to a greater understanding that God is teaching us. There's no point in time when you're drawing breath on this planet that God is not in the process of transforming you into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Molding and shaping Molding us. and shaping us. Working his good pleasure, his will and good pleasure in us. So when we're talking about these cows of a shame, we're talking about what's going on here. They oppress the poor, right? We're talking about that. Mm -hmm. We live at a time when homosexuality is rampant beyond belief yeah. in the world that we live in. Celebrated, mm -hmm. absolutely celebrated, promoted and celebrated around the world today. And you think about God's, how does God feel about, well, what was the sin of Sodom? Don't, okay, don't answer the question. Think, what, what word comes to your mind when you think about the sin of Sodom? Because I, I think typically... People think, Christians think homosexuality. And homosexuality was obviously a major, major problem in Sodom. That was a symptom, not the root. That, that's what I'm going to say. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that was not, that was a sin, but it is a symptom of a greater sin, right? Think about what the Word of God says, because that's where we learn the truth. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. 
Ezekiel 16.49. That was the sin of Sodom. It was like here with these cows of Bashan. They're having abundant ease in the midst of you know, others who are suffering, and they don't care. The true sin of Sodom was that they lacked the love of God. Yes. Not that he was in, in themselves. They did not have the love of God. We just have self-love. Well, of course. I, mean, I know we talked about this last week because that's what John wrote in his first letter. And he said, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? First mm. John 3.17. So Sodom... I mean, they, they just weren't caring about anybody else. They were lovers of self and lovers of money. Is that not what was going on here in Israel when God sends Amos up from the south to prophesy this? So today, homosexuality is again a major issue, not only tolerated by the world, but promoted. But yet again, that is also a symptom of greater sin. Okay, okay. That's a symptom of a greater sin. They will not worship God. That's it. Mankind worships actors, athletes, singers, and the rich, refusing even to acknowledge the maker of heaven and earth who gave his son. Mm -hmm. Listen, we were born to praise. We were born, made to, to worship. Yes. So you're going to worship somebody. You're going to serve somebody. You know, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, but you're going to serve one and you're going to despise the other. OK, so in Romans chapter one, I'm going to read you verses 24 to 27. And this is important. Please get this. This is so important in our day and age. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. You know what? You can have all the debates you want about homosexuality, but homosexuality, the practice of homosexuality is a sin. Okay. That doesn't mean that God won't love a homosexual who repents and may still have that desire, mm -hmm. but we're supposed to be able to put aside those lusts. Okay. Perhaps the reason that this, this issue of worship, and that's the issue, that they're worship, they don't know how to worship. They're worshiping the creature, man, rather than worshiping the creator. Perhaps the reason for that is that the church, which is supposed to be that light of the world and the salt of the earth, is supposed to be showing what worshiping in spirit and truth is, but it doesn't even know itself, apparently. No, they, they think worship is a slow song. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, when you go into your quote unquote, house of worship on Sunday, your day of worship. Remember the conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan woman, all right? In the Gospel of John, John chapter four. This is the Samaritan woman at the well. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about back to Bethel, the altars, right? Right, right. And in Jerusalem in the temple. But Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. When Abraham took his son, his only son, Isaac, mm -hmm. up the mountain to offer him as a sacrifice, because God called him to that, he said to his servants at the bottom, the ones who were left below, he said, 
that he and Isaac were going up the mountain to, to worship. worship. Genesis 22, 5. So what musical instrument was being carried and what slow song did Abraham sing on the top of that mountain? You know, that's not about it. That worship, which is probably the very first use of the word in the Bible, was about a heart that was willing to give the thing that was most precious to him to back to God, back to God, because God had given it to him, right? He was willing to obey without reservation. If there is a worship song, I believe it would have to be, I surrender all. I was going to say that. I, I really mean that. All right, I'm going to go on and read Amos uh, 4, but I'm going to read verses 2 and 3. Okay. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through the breaches in the wall, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to harmony. That's castle or palace in King James. Declares the Lord. Cast where? Castles or in King James. Oh. Either castles or palaces. It's a high. What he's saying is they're going to take, there's going to be breaches in the wall. In other words, the wall is going to be broken down. Okay, mm -hmm. this is what happened when the Assyrians actually came in and conquered Israel a little after this and carted the people off into captivity, right? This is God's speaking through the prophet. It, it's a promise of God. Oh, how beautiful are the promises of God, eh? Mm -hmm. The Lord was about to deal harshly, to say the least, with the people of Israel, a people that he had delivered by his mighty hand from captivity in Egypt. And he's saying now they're going to be delivered over by him to captivity in Assyria. They had heard the greatest, the foremost command. These are people, they were out in the wilderness. They heard the greatest command. What's the greatest command? Well, Jesus was asked that question in Matthew 22. He said, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, Asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So here you had the quote unquote people of God. And they were certainly not loving their neighbors. Yeah. It was all about the love of self. Right. And they had chosen to disobey that command. So that doesn't mean that they weren't being religious. Okay? Because it goes on in, in verses 4 and 5 there in the fourth chapter of Amos. And God says, enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings, making them known. For you so love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. They were doing all of the religious stuff. Right. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but this becomes increasingly clear and should be crystal clear as the Lord would speak through Amos a bit further on. And God spoke to Amos saying this. I'm reading chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. God is speaking to the people of Israel who are being religious. And he says, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Mm. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sounds of your harps, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Once again, this goes to the issue of God's love, which is absent in these people of God, as we have seen evidence of. And yet they were still being very, quote unquote, churchy, much like the church of Laodicea. Yes. Right. Because in Laodicea, they were saying, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know, Jesus said, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3.17. So, but also like the church of Laodicea, Jesus was left on the outside. Yes. 
I mean, we can debate and think about this all day. Why did he have to send a prophet from the south up to Israel? Yes, there's nobody there. I'm well. It's the school of the prophets. (laughs) So I'm, I'm saying that this goes to the issue. Their selfishness goes to the issue of love, a lack of God's love. Think about what Paul said. I mean, this has got to be one of the most marvelous, sweetest chapters to hear. Mm. 1 Corinthians 13. Mm. Paul said, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. First Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. You see, you can do all the religious stuff. You can be all churchy. But if you don't have love, God's love, it profits nothing. Religion without relationship which is only made possible by the, that, that relationship is made possible by the atoning work of Jesus Christ, is what Isaiah spoke of when he talked about all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. To him, right? Mm-hmm. Isaiah 64, 6. So now, as the Lord is about to declare a litany of disasters that he brought upon his own people, let's begin with this understanding. We're going to look at this and see God's what appears to be a very harsh God. That's why it's important to understand before we do that. I want to just think about this. God desires that none should perish, but for all to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Second Peter three, nine. The Lord longs to be gracious to us and waits on high to have compassion on us. Isaiah 30, 18. The Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, rather that they should return and live. Ezekiel 18, 23. Nothing that he does in the life of a believer will have any result other than working good for us. Romans 8, 28. To those who love him, according to his purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So we can, like Job, accept good from God as well as accepting adversity from God. Mm -hmm. Job 2.10. Go read these things. I hope you're making little notes here, right? And we can give thanks in the midst of the good, in the midst of the bad, in the midst of the ugly, the good, the bad, and the ugly, knowing that he is working his plan in our lives. Yes. So we can, we are commanded to give thanks. First Thessalonians 5.18. You see, and all the things he does, he makes a way. And we're going to get into that next week and talk about the way that he makes through all of these things. But Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Lord, that you discipline those whom you love. Lord, that if you didn't discipline us, we wouldn't be your children. Lord, create in us a clean heart. Lord, show, expose the ways in our lives that are not pleasing to you, Lord God, that we might repent of them and have them out of our lives. Our desire is above all to be pleasing to you, to be more like you. Father, that we might be more of a witness to this dark, dark world that we live in. We praise you and thank you that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. And you can use our weakness to show forth your strength. Hallelujah. Till next time. God bless you. Cling to the